Hello, friends. Welcome back to this series where we go through and explain the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. Today, we move on to chapter four, which is all about angular momentum. In particular, a new form of this observable is introduced, one that is intrinsic to a particle known as its spin. I have said before that we would go through chapter one, which covers the historical development of quantum mechanics. After we are done with chapter three, but I feel that we should make hay while the sun shines and forge ahead to cover a few more important topics in quantum mechanics. Things like the spin of a particle, which decides if it's a boson or a fermion, which in turn affects the particle statistics, and what happens when a quantum system is perturbed, both in a time-independent and time-dependent way, or how to do approximations in quantum mechanics. Which is what is actually done in most cases, since most systems are too complicated to solve exactly. All of these will be covered in this chapter or those that follow. Therefore, we shall postpone the historical development to a later date. To begin, let's motivate the introduction of a new quantum number, which will turn out to be spin. Let's start with the hydrogen atom, as we have worked out in lecture thirteen and fourteen. The energy states of the electron in the hydrogen atom can be distinguished by three quantum numbers: the principal quantum number n, the angular momentum number l, and m, the third component of angular momentum. The energy of the state only depends on the quantum number n. L is related to the square of the orbital angular momentum. And takes only integer values. This is established in lecture ten. Furthermore, the allowable values of L is constrained by the principal quantum number n, as explained in lecture fourteen. M describes the value of the third component of angular momentum in units of h bar, and takes positive or negative integer values that are constrained by L. This we derive in lecture eleven. The key point to note is that both L and M are of integer values. This shall soon change with further experimental data. Each n contains several different angular momentum states, but all with the same energy. This is a feature of the Coulomb interaction used in the model for the hydrogen atom introduced in Lecture 13, but this is not completely accurate. There is actually a small splitting of energy with respect to the different values of L. These orbitals don't exactly have the same energy. Because the real interaction between the nucleus and the electron is actually more complicated than just the Coulomb potential, there are actually multiple small effects that are dependent on the angular momentum L that we have not considered in our simple model. This is to be expected, but as long as the states that should be there are there, their small energy differences could still be accounted for by including these small effects. Recall that each state also carries the quantum number m associated with the third component of angular momentum. Why doesn't the energy split along the different values of m? This has to do with the rotational invariance of the interactions within the hydrogen atom. In the Heisenberg's picture, this means that the Hamiltonian describing the hydrogen atom must be unchanged by the unitary transformations, which represent rotations. Our basic model, which includes the Coulomb interaction, possesses this invariance. So must the other effects that may be sensitive to angular momentum. The only rotational invariant angular momentum observables can only be a function of L square. For example, they cannot just simply depend on L three in some other configurations, except in the dot product. Therefore, the energy must necessarily be independent of m by rotational symmetry.
Recall that in lecture 15, we have worked out the energy difference between the first excited state and the ground state. This is approximately equal to 10 electron volts. If converted to the wavelength of light emitted, this will be about 100 nanometers, which is 1000 angstroms. 1 angstrom is about 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. As mentioned in lecture 15, our simple model not only works for hydrogen, but also for more complicated multi-electron atoms like the alkaline metals. For example, elements like lithium, sodium, and potassium, just to name a few. Even though these atoms all have different atomic numbers, they can be effectively described by Z equals 1. Because in these cases, much of the central charges in the nucleus have been shielded by the inner core of tightly bound electrons, leaving just one outer electron, which experiences a Coulomb attraction of effectively Z equals 1. This is just like a hydrogen atom, so the single electron model in the yellow box works quite well for such cases. It is by observing the spectral lines of sodium that physicists notice some discrepancies. There are more lines than can be accounted for. For example, focusing on n equals 3, on the orbitals s and p. It was observed that the level which corresponds to orbital p is actually a doublet. The transition of the higher level to orbital s emits a photon of wavelength 5890 angstroms, while that emitted from the lower level is 5896 angstroms. That is, the two levels that form the doublet are very closely spaced compared with the energy spacings between the levels with different values of n. These two spectral lines are known as the sodium D lines that result from the transitions between the levels 3s and 3p. The name is just due to historical reasons and have nothing to do with the SPDF notation used for the quantum number L. Let's convert all these numbers to energies for better comparison since a bigger wavelength number actually corresponds to lower energy, which is kind of confusing. For this, we just need the Planck formula and the relation between angular frequency and wave number for light. Recall that k is related to the wavelength by. From earlier, we have stated that delta E n is roughly 10 electron volts. The energy spacing between the doublets delta E over this value is given by. The spacing between the doublet is merely 2 out of 10,000th of the energy between the first excited state and the ground state. Thus this splitting is aptly called the fine structure. It is observed everywhere except the orbital S. Pauli suggests that this doubling, which cannot be accounted for by the quantum numbers NLM, must be due to a fourth quantum number, which was then unknown. He called it a two-valueness not describable classically. Note again that the quantum number m cannot account for the different energies due to rotational invariance and so is irrelevant to this problem. In 1925, two physicists, Uhlenbeck and Goldsmith, proposed that this observable could be a new form of angular momentum associated with the rotation of the electron about its own axis which had not been considered previously, and in other words, its spin. This was a reasonable guess back then, since much of the multiplicity of the energy levels in atoms could be explained by the orbital angular momentum. Thus, spin could be viewed as an intrinsic form of angular momentum. Applying what we know about orbital angular momentum, in which the multiplicity of L is 2L plus 1, to get a doublet, L would have to be half. Let's use another letter for this. S for spin.
Thus we say that an electron has spin half. And in analogy to the orbital case, we expect there to be shared eigenstates between the square and the third component of spin. These shall be proven in due time. An objection immediately arises. How could angular momentum be of half integer value? Since it can be shown that the orbital angular momentum can only take integer values, we did this in lecture 10. It will turn out that if we extend the concept of angular momentum through the principles of symmetry, such values are also allowed. After all, only the multiplicity of angular momentum needs to be an integer. But what does it mean for an electron to have an internal angular momentum of half of h bar? Suppose this corresponds to an angular velocity omega of the electron rotating about its own axis, and that the electron actually has a finite radius r with a moment of inertia approximated by its mass times r square. We can write the left hand side in terms of the rotational velocity v. This is the speed at which the surface of the electron is moving. If the right hand side is fixed, the smaller the electron radius, the larger its surface velocity. This velocity can only go as high as the speed of light according to Einstein's relativity. This corresponds to the minimum radius an electron can have. The problem is that, even at its smallest value, this radius would have been observed already, which it had not. Let's try and work out the actual predicted electron radius without doing any real calculations. Anything that relates to the size of an atom can be compared with Bohr's radius. This is worked out in details in lecture 15. It approximates the average size of an atom to be roughly 500 of a nanometer. How would the electron radius compare with this? From the yellow box, this ratio is half that of a dimensionless constant, e squared over h bar c, which defines the fine structure constant, alpha. And famously, this has the value of approximately 1 over 137. Therefore, if an electron has a finite size, it is at least 100th the size of an atom, and would have already been observed. So argued some physicists back then, including Pauli. Let's complete this calculation and compare with Weinberg's figure in the book. And so, we have the radius of approximately 2 times 10 to the power of minus 11 centimeters, agreeing with Weinberg. One more thing to note on the fine structure constant. If you were to try to write down a dimensionless constant less than 1 to describe small perturbations due to the effects of quantum electrodynamics, you would come up with the expression in the green box. The charge E and velocity C takes care of electrodynamics and h-bar to quantum effects. Setting aside all the objections about whether an electron can have spin, let's first develop a more general theory of angular momentum that could include spin. In lecture 7, we are led to the orbital angular momentum L while constructing the generators of rotations. This is done by requiring that the unitary operator's generator rotate any known vector operator in the way prescribed by the rotation matrix which acts on 3D vectors. Omega is the rotation vector, indicating the direction of rotation and by how much. The known vector operators include both position and momentum, and as it turns out, also L itself. We wish to add to this list spin the new form of angular momentum. And we now demand that the total angular momentum j 
be the actual generator of rotations, which will rotate all vectors. L must be replaced, since it could only rotate orbital vectors that are functions of x and p. The rotation equation now acts as a constraint on the new generator S. This will also establish some relations between S and L, as we shall see. For now, let's first learn more about the rotation matrix R. R is a 3 by 3 matrix, while V is a column vector. In components form, this looks like. Note that we are using Einstein's convention, where repeated indices are summed over, so as not to have to keep writing summations. If two vectors, V and W, are both rotated, their dot product must necessarily be preserved. This is a defining property of rotations and is a condition on R. We can see this more clearly in components form. Let's highlight I, the index that is summed over. The term indicated by the braces must be equal to the Kronecker's delta in order for the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side. Since V and W are arbitrary vectors, R must satisfy the condition in the yellow box. We can also write this as a matrix multiplication. The transpose of R is actually its inverse. This is the definition of an orthogonal matrix. These are 3 by 3 matrices if we are talking about rotations in 3D space, but this discussion can easily be extended to an arbitrary n dimensions. Let's calculate the determinant of both sides of this equation. The determinant of the product of two matrices is just the product of the two determinants, and of course, the determinant of an identity matrix is 1. Thus, the square of the determinant of a rotation matrix must be equal to 1. This gives two possibilities for the value of the determinant. Matrices with determinants that are plus or minus 1 are known as unimodular. Since the identity matrix is also considered a rotation by zero amount, we shall consider only R with determinant 1. Therefore, the set of all orthogonal n by n matrices with determinant 1, also known as SON, defines the rotation matrices for n dimensions. The letter S means special, referring to the matrices having determinant 1. SON is an example of what is known as a group. The definition of a group is as follows. Firstly, the composition of any two elements of a group must belong to the same group. In our case, composition means matrix multiplication. This is true for our example. The transpose of R3 is given by. Multiplying this transpose with R3 gives, which must be equal to 1 since both R1 and R2 satisfy the conditions of the group in the green box. Therefore, R3 satisfies the first condition. What about its determinant? The determinant of R3 must be equal to 1, as both R1 and R2 do. Thus R3 satisfies both conditions and therefore belongs to the group. The second property of a group is that the inverse of any element 
must also belong to the group. For the case of SON, this is obvious by its definition, since the transpose is the inverse. And the transpose of any element also satisfies the group conditions and must belong to the group. The third property of a group is that it must contain the identity. This is also obvious in our case, since the identity satisfies both conditions in a trivial way. These three properties constitute the definition of a group, which may be specified by conditions different from those in the green box. These are specific to SON. Let's expand R in a power series in terms of its parameters, omega. Omega has the same number of indices as R, and thus is able to hold all the information about these matrices. Notice that the zeroth order term is delta ij, which corresponds to no rotations. This means R approaches the identity matrix as omega goes to zero. Thus we are dealing only with matrices that are connected to the identity in a continuous way. Using this expansion, the orthogonality of R gives. If omega is infinitesimal, we can just drop the higher order terms. Thus the orthogonality of R implies that omega must be an anti-symmetric matrix. This result also holds for finite rotations, since we can take the infinitesimal limit by setting some constant of proportionality lambda to be small. This would not change the anti-symmetry of omega. Therefore, the group of rotations can be characterized by these anti-symmetric matrices. It is straightforward to count the number of independent parameters in this matrix. This is just the number of off-diagonal elements in an n by n matrix. Let's focus on the group of 3D rotations. Such a rotation can be specified by the direction of the axis of rotation and its magnitude, which are three parameters. This agrees with our formula. An important property of rotations is that they can be formed by combining an infinite number of infinitesimal rotations. This is most obvious when all the rotations are in the same direction. We shall make much use of this result. But what is the relation between the matrix omega and the rotation vector? Keep this question in mind. We shall have the answer in a moment. Let's see how we can construct an operator that will rotate quantum states instead of 3D vectors. That is, Let's construct the representation of rotation in Hilbert space. These are unitary operators. To see why symmetry transformations like rotations must be represented by unitary operators, refer to lectures 3 and 4. Expanding UR in a power series in terms of omega, we have Note that the zeroth order term must be an identity operator corresponding to no rotation. With the convention of including the factor i over 2 h bar and omega real, the operator j i j, which pairs with each component of omega, must be a Hermitian operator. This is so that u is unitary. We can see this by going to infinitesimal omega. This implies u dagger u to be requiring that this be equal to 1. This means j is Hermitian. Note that the subscripts of J labels the operators and not the matrix components. 
These are the generators of rotations. Another property of J is that it is anti-symmetric in its indices. It is always possible to choose J such that this is true. This is due to the fact that omega is anti-symmetric. Suppose we start off with J tilde, which may not be anti-symmetric. We can write this sum as... Using the rate box, this becomes... We can define this as J, which is anti-symmetric. The beauty of representation theory is that we can derive very general results. For example, the operators J, I, J can themselves be matrices if they are acting in a discrete or finite dimensional space. So UR is a unitary matrix in this space. An immediate example is the 3D real space where the matrices R themselves lives. This can be seen by assigning JIJ with the matrix components. The effects of these matrix elements become clear in the sum above. I is mapped into K and J into L, or the reverse order, with an additional minus sign. The matrix elements of the identity is the delta symbol. Thus we see that for infinitesimal rotations, UR is equal to R if J are the matrices below. Of course, this equality immediately extends to finite rotations. Just combine the infinitesimals. The unitary matrix that corresponds to the infinitesimal rotation is given by where the matrix for J is used. Again, if we build up this infinitesimal, we would of course get the same R for finite omega. But there's another way to express this. Using the limit definition of an exponential function, we can also write this as the exponential form of a unitary operator. This form is general and holds for any representation of J. Thus our abstract representation U even includes R itself with the proper choice of the generators J. The specific form of J below corresponds to the matrices R and is the defining representation of rotation. The question now is, how do we define rotations for quantum states? Of course, regardless of our choices, we shall stick with the convention of anti-symmetric generators. Previously, it is said that the composition of two group elements must give another group element. In fact, the specific composition rule can be used to define a group. Different rules correspond to different symmetries. Therefore, any representation of rotation must also satisfy its composition rule, like so. Any representation that mirrors the composition rule of a symmetry group exactly, like in the red box, is known as a faithful representation. But it may just so happen that UR2 times UR1 gives U of R2 times R1 with an additional phase which could depend on the rotations. Since all quantum states that differ from each other by a phase are physically equivalent, this should not lead to any inconsistencies in the representation. So we are left with two possibilities when representing the action of R3 on a quantum state side. 
When there are more than one way of representing the same element, R3 in this example. We say that the representation is not faithful. We claim that transformations that can be built up of infinitesimals combine faithfully according to the rule in the yellow box. Let's prove this. By definition, R is the faithful representation of itself. Its generators are given by the earlier expression in the blue box. We shall show that these form an algebra. That is, their commutators with each other form a linear combination among themselves. The reason why it is important for these operators to form an algebra is because not only does it ensure that the group is closed under composition, that is, two group elements combine to form a third one, but it also determines the specific way that group elements combine. We can even use the algebra to define the group. These results are worked out in details in Lecture 4 using the campbell baker hausdorff formula proved in Lecture 3. Let's now work out these commutators. We can do this by brute force, using the expression in the blue box. But it is actually easier to proceed through an indirect way by first working out the effect of rotation on J. We start with an infinitesimal rotation. Let's rotate this by another transformation which represents R prime. This is done by sandwiching it between two operators, like the usual way an observable transforms under symmetry in the Heisenberg's picture. Since we are dealing with the defining representation associated with J in the blue box, these two operators are just R prime itself together with its inverse. With J given in the blue box, the middle term is just the identity plus the omega matrix. For the infinitesimal rotation, R omega. This gives where the argument of R is replaced by the transform omega. Note that the two terms in the red boxes are matrices with their components implicit. The indices shown labels the matrices themselves. Let's write out this matrix multiplication explicitly. We should focus on comparing the coefficients of omega on both sides of this equation. The inverse of R prime is just R prime transpose. Note that to obtain the relation in the yellow box, we have used R in the form that depends only on omega, as well as the form where its dependence on the generators J is made explicit. The equality of these two forms are the result of using J in the blue box, which corresponds to the defining representation of R. In this indirect way, the yellow box is dependent on the blue box. This equation allows us to calculate the commutators of J among themselves. Let's expand this, now setting R prime to be an infinitesimal rotation. Omega is an anti-symmetric matrix. Writing out R prime in terms of J, and applying these to our equation, Let's expand out the left hand side, keeping omega to the first order. And out comes the commutator we are looking for. Now expand the right hand side, but with r prime in terms of just omega.
The two delta terms just leave j unchanged. Now the terms that are first order in omega. Using the anti-symmetry of omega, we can further separate the indices k and i by contraction with a delta. Do the same for the last term. Note that the objective is to separate out the same omega kl from the last two terms. Both sides of this equation are equal only under contractions of omega prime, hence this notation. Because now, only the left-hand side is anti-symmetric with respect to the indices i and j, while the right-hand side is not. Same for the indices k and l, so they could not possibly be equal without contractions with omega prime. Therefore, it is necessary to anti-symmetrize both sides of this equation. Let's start with the left-hand side. We take the term itself, minus the one with i and j switched, then multiply by half. Of course, this leaves the left-hand side unchanged, since it is already anti-symmetric with respect to these indices. Now for the first term on the right-hand side. And the second term. As you can see, now both sides are anti-symmetric with respect to the two pairs of indices, and we can take away the contractions with omega prime. Thus the generators j really form an algebra. We can view the result in the green box as the property of j in the blue box, which corresponds to the defining representation, where ur is simply equal to r. Another consequence of the blue box is the red box, which says that the defining representation is also a faithful representation. This is true by definition, and there is a well-defined rule for group composition. For example, the composition of r omega 1 with r omega 2 gives r omega 3, where omega 3 is some function of omega 1 and 2, which characterizes rotation. An alternate path to the red box is through the green box. In fact, once we have the commutation relations in the green box, we can forget about the blue box. The implication of the red box from the green box is independent of representation. This is due to the results about symmetry groups from the previous lectures. More specifically, we could have started with j in some arbitrary representation that satisfies the commutation relations, and construct the unitary operator which represents r in the usual way. These transformations would automatically satisfy the correct composition rule for rotations. This is due to the fact that any two representations with generators that satisfy the same commutation relations must follow the same composition rules. That is, they have the same function for omega 3 in terms of omega 1 and 2. This is due to the CBH formula proved in lecture 3. We have made use of this result to demonstrate that the algebra determines group composition in lecture 4. Note that the exponential form in the yellow box applies only to groups which elements could be built up from infinitesimal transformations. Thus we have shown that their representations must be faithful, as in the red box. We now know how to construct the representation of rotation for quantum states. We just need to find Hermitian operators that satisfy the commutation relations in the green box to act as generators. In fact, this is a general recipe for constructing representations of continuous groups.
Let's look back at this relation derived earlier for the defining representation of rotation. If we use the exponential form of the transformation in the rate box, the right hand side of the equation becomes there's a way of evaluating this expression in terms of j using just the commutators among these generators. Remember identity 1, which we have derived in lecture 3, concerning some arbitrary operators c and g, where the adjoint action of c on g is defined by their commutator. We can apply this to the yellow box. Due to the commutation relations satisfied by J, we expect the result to be some linear combination of J. This should be the same for all representations, since the commutation relations are independent of representation. And this linear combination of J should be exactly equal to those on the right hand side of the above equation. Therefore, this equation should be independent of representation. And is true not only for the defining representation. What the blue box says is that J transforms like a rank 2 tensor. Each index of a tensor transforms like a vector under rotation. A vector operator should rotate in the way shown in the rate box. This is true in any representation. We can make use of this equation to extract the commutator between a vector operator and the generator J. The steps are very similar to those taken to derive the commutators for J from the equation in the blue box. Let's go through them quickly. As before, we shall assume infinitesimal rotations. But this time, we will be working in an arbitrary representation such that UR is not identical to R. Let's apply the yellow box to the left hand side of this equation. Expanding this to the first order in omega. Again, we can already see the commutator. Now apply R in the green box to the right hand side. VK cancels on both sides. In order to compare the coefficients of omega on both sides of this equation, we need to anti-symmetrize the term on the right hand side with respect to i and j, since on the left hand side it is already anti-symmetric. Now we can factor away omega. And we are left with the commutator between the vector operator and the rotation generators. This is actually something we have seen before, but in a different form. We shall make the connection later. The formalism we have built up till now have generators which are anti-symmetric to index tensors. And they are paired with rotation parameters omega, which are similarly two index objects. On the surface, this doesn't seem to fit the parallel development of rotations in chapter 7. The rotation operators there have single index generators and parameters. So what's the relation between them? We now show that they are in fact equivalent. Let's start with the contraction of omega and j for the two index case and using the anti-symmetric property. We can factor out j by inserting some delta symbols. The term within the bracket is anti-symmetric with respect to i and j. These delta symbols select the values of the indices in the sum such that i equals i prime and j equals j prime and subtract those in the reverse order, i equals j prime 
and j equals i prime. We have actually encountered the expression in the red box before, back in lecture 7. This is equal to the contraction of a pair of Levi-Civita symbols from the epsilon contraction identity. Note that the highlighted indices k are the ones summed over. The epsilon identity is valid for three dimensions. Let's pair omega and j with each epsilon. The epsilon symbol converts the two index omega parameter into the single index version. And similarly for j. And the two forms a dot product. Let's remind ourselves of the definition of the Levi Civita symbol. It is totally anti symmetric in its indices, with epsilon 1, 2, 3 equals 1. Each transposition of the indices of this term adds a minus sign. By these definitions, we still have the same number of omegas and the same number of j's. There's one more thing about epsilon that will be important for us. Under rotation, each index of epsilon transforms by the action of the rotation matrix R. Due to the anti-symmetry of epsilon, the result will remain totally anti-symmetric. Furthermore, the 1, 2, 3 component of this is given by. This is actually the definition of the determinant of R by the Leibniz formula which is equal to 1. These two properties of the transform epsilon are precisely the ones that define the levi civita symbol. Hence the epsilon symbol is invariant under rotations. Let's see what this says about the single index generator, jk. Specifically, how does it rotate? Just look at the two index version of j. We rotate an operator by sandwiching it between two unitary operators representing the rotation. So the two index j in jk will rotate according to the rule in the blue box. Epsilon being a number is not a factor. But since it is invariant under the action of R, let's apply R to it anyway. Putting all these together, we have These two terms are contracted through I prime. And gives delta M K double prime, since R is an orthogonal matrix. This k double prime is contracted with the one on j. Turning k double prime to m, let's bring this pair of j's together. And we end up with a single index j in the red box. Thus the single index j rotates like a vector. This is the direct consequence of the two index version rotating like a tensor and the invariance of the epsilon symbol. We can actually invert the definition of the single index j in terms of the two index 1 by contracting jk with epsilon ijk. Then we will have two epsilons contracting by a single index. Again, we can use the epsilon contraction identity. The delta symbols then contract with j through the indices i prime j prime. This results in an anti-symmetric combination of j i j. Since j is anti-symmetric, we have Thus the two index generator and its single index counterpart are equivalent, one can be expressed in terms of the other. 
A similar relation also applies to the rotation parameters omega. Using the representation of 3D rotations, let's now work out the commutators of the single index J. We shall knit this relation between omegas in a minute, so let's keep it as reference. Specifically, we need the second form of UR, and the transformation rule for the vector generator. As usual, to extract the commutators, we look at infinitesimal rotations. Applying these to the equation in the green box, we have Now we can write this double index omega in terms of the single index 1 using the equation in the red box and transposing the indices j and k. Note that the coefficients of omega on both sides of this equation are both anti-symmetric in i and j, so no anti-symmetrization is needed. and we obtain the commutators of the vector generators, j's. Recall that these are the exact commutation relations satisfied by the orbital angular momentum L, derived in lecture 7. But they are the results of the canonical commutation relations between x and p, and the definition of L in terms of them, while the commutation relations between j's are due to the fact that they are the true generators of rotations, and rotate all observables. L rotates only the orbital observables. J rotates like a vector, and this leads to the commutation relations between J's. From the general rule for rotating all vectors, we have a similar set of commutation relations between J and V. V now includes all vector operators, both orbital and intrinsic. Using these two sets of commutators and the definition of the total angular momentum J in terms of L and S, we can now work out the commutators involving the spin. Let's first look at the commutator between S and L. We can use the equation at the top for the first term, using L for V. The second term corresponds to the second commutator. Note that the second argument for both of these commutators is Lj. This means they lead to the same result, the red boxes at the top, and cancels. Thus the spin operator commutes with the orbital angular momentum. What about the commutator between different components of spin? Using the definition of spin for the second argument, we can immediately drop L due to the result just obtained. Again replacing S with its definition. and switching the ordering of the second term, absorbing the minus sign. Both terms can be evaluated using the first commutator at the top. Transposing the indices i and j of the epsilon symbol. Thus the spin operator also forms an algebra, similar to J and L. We have shown earlier that S commutes with the orbital angular momentum. This is in fact more general. S actually commutes with all orbital observables, that is, those that are composed from X and P. We can see this without further calculations. Suppose we have an orbital vector V. The commutator of S with this is given by The last two terms must be equal and should cancel. 
because L rotates an orbital vector in exactly the same way as J. Thus we have the commutators of spin. The first set says S is an angular momentum, while the second says it is an intrinsic property. After all these rather abstract discussions, let's compare our representation to an actual rotation. For example, the counterclockwise rotation about the axis n through an angle delta phi. We shall consider an infinitesimal rotation. Let's apply this to the position vector. From this figure, the change in position due to the rotation is given by This is the effect of an infinitesimal rotation, delta phi, on the position vector. Let's generate this by applying our representation of rotation to the position operator. Switching i and j. In vector notation, we have Thus the rotation at the top is represented by the transformation below with omega equals minus delta phi. This directly generalizes to finite rotation. Therefore the counterclockwise rotation by the vector phi is represented by the unitary operator in the yellow box. Not to sound like a broken record. Our formalism for rotations generalizes easily to the case of a multi-particle system. Just attach a particle label to every angular momentum and sum it over. The commutators for spin and orbital angular momenta becomes We will just have an additional delta symbol for the particle labels because operators of different particles commute. And of course, spin always commutes with orbital angular momentum. This total angular momentum is then the true generator of rotations and rotates everything. Here's a potential source of confusion. Earlier, we have said that SON is the group of n by n orthogonal matrices with determinant 1. This is the group of n-dimensional rotations. This means its elements rotate vectors with n components. Then there is the n-dimensional representation of the group SO3. Even though this is the group of three-dimensional rotations, its elements are also n by n matrices, same as those in the other case. The two cases are distinctively different because the number of generators in SON is n times n minus 1 over 2, and 3 for SO3. The group of rotations is only one example of continuous groups also known as Lie groups, and their members can all be represented in the familiar exponential form. With generators that form Lie algebras, which are specific to a group, we have covered all these extensively in Lecture 4. So before we go, let's quickly demonstrate an often mentioned property of Lie groups, that their generators are traceless. This can be seen by direct calculations, just take the trace on both sides of this equation. <laughs> 
Recall the cyclic property of the trace. These cancel to zero. Thus, the generators of Lie groups are indeed traceless. If you like this video, consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel and get notified whenever a new video is ready. See you next time and thanks for watching.